On this episode, we visit St. Louis to learn about the Pedestrian and Bicycle Council of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Then we head north to Minneapolis for the Safe Routes to School National Conference. We look at the need for sidewalks in Edina, Minnesota. Finally, we drop in on the Corporate Cycling Challenge bike ride in Omaha, Nebraska. Stay tuned. We're in St. Louis, Missouri, talking with Jeff Rigner, who's chair of the ITE Ed and Bike Council. What, uh, first of all, what's going on in St. Louis this week? Well, there are a lot of interesting sessions happening. Uh, two of them are, are directly related to the Pedestrian and Bicycle Council. Uh, one of them is an opportunity to talk about how we evaluate complete streets, which I'm sure you've covered in your program at some point. Uh, and the other is kind of a smorgasbord of topics that our council has been addressing over the last f few months. And what, what is the council? How, how, IT, the Institute of Transportation Engineers, how does it work? Well, the, uh, ITE has a number of technical councils that address specific technical issues within the profession. Uh, the Pedestrian Bicycle Council is a very active and growing council. Uh, we have over 600 members from all across the world, primarily in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and it's folks who are really interested in doing technical work in advancing the pedestrian and bicycle profession and in providing kind of a bridge for uh, between research topics in the pedestrian and bicycle world and people who are actually putting practice on the ground. And then the annual meetings going on uh, this week, and, and you have your sessions here at the annual meeting. What goes on the rest of the year? Well, we have three in-person meetings. Uh, this one always happens in the in the summer. Uh, we also have a meeting in Washington in January and a technical conference in March or April, uh, where we get together to really try to present topics that are of interest to the broader community, not just pedestrian and bicycle folks, but other traffic engineers that form the bulk of IT's membership. And you mentioned complete streets. Uh, uh, I assume that addresses a lot of engineer, engineering uh, yeah, areas besides just you know pedestrians. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a complete street? Why is it important? Well, complete streets. The textbook definition is that they're streets that are designed for all users of all ages and abilities. So anyone can walk, bike, take transit, or drive along these streets in a reasonable way. They're important for a lot of reasons, not just from the equity perspective that you might expect. Not everyone owns cars, and so they need other ways to get around. But also, they're very important from a public health perspective. They've proven in a lot of cities to really kind of revitalize communities, because folks don't want to just drive through a neighborhood. Uh, when folks walk and bike through commercial areas, they tend to buy more. Uh, they tend to be more involved in the community. and really tends to be a quality of life issue as well. So what's uh, what, what's happening with the complete streets idea? Uh, you know, there's, the the term just came up a few years ago, and and now there seems to be a lot of interest in it. Where is it? Where is it going? Well, a lot of things are happening on a national basis. Uh, the National Complete Streets Coalition, which is an umbrella group based in Washington, uh, estimates that over 200 policies have been adopted from states, cities, counties, small towns all across the country mandating that when projects move forward they need to accommodate all modes of travel along all streets which is a fantastic development uh, what we're trying to do as part of ITE is provide some technical basis behind that our current uh, primary research project is if determining what tools exist so communities can determine how complete their streets really are and evaluate if they have a project proposed uh, what types of amenities should be put in to make the street as complete as possible and provide the best benefits for the community. So you're very much looking at maybe getting some, some numbers to attach to things rather than a warm, fuzzy, well, it, it seems okay to walk along here. That's absolutely true. And, you know, our job right now is to determine what tools are out there, and there are many of them for determining what some of those benefits are. So the communities can take that then to their elected officials, to boards, to the, the technical folks within their, their staff organizations to say, hey, here are the benefits of doing this. It's beyond just that warm, fuzzy feeling you're talking about. There's some real benefits to our community. And, uh, your website mentions uh, quite a number of things uh, the, the Ped Bike Council is working on. Uh, what are some of the other important ones? 
well, there are two technical projects that either have just finished or are nearly finished. One of them is automated pedestrian detection. In other words, you often, when you're walking up to a traffic signal, uh, you find a push button that you push as a pedestrian so that you can cross the street. Uh, there are a number of technologies that are being looked at now that passively detect pedestrians. In other words, when you walk up, a camera or a sensitive pad or something like that determines that you're there. And you don't even need to push the button, so you don't need to worry about malfunctioning buttons or things like that for crossing. That report's just been published. Uh, we're also working on a report on separated bikeways. Uh, cycle tracks are what they're often called in, in some areas. Uh, it's a very controversial topic. Some folks uh, feel that that separated facility really provides a, an opportunity for folks who wouldn't cycle otherwise to be able to get around communities. Others who really feel that a cyclist's best place is in the street mixed with traffic, being the, that being the safest place for them, don't feel that they're necessarily the best type of facility. So we're trying to present both of those sides objectively and give good information to practitioners about what the best times are to use them. Yeah, a lot of people that you know, aren't in that field, don't, you know, sometimes they're surprised at the, the passion you come across that, you know, you know, bike lanes or other separate, or separate facilities are, are wonderful versus they're the work of the devil. Um, is, is, is that a, def, a difficult thing to, to balance when you're trying to give an objective report? It is. Uh, our goal is to really present both types, both points of view. Uh, the report's not necessarily design guidelines or anything like that. It's really presenting the current state of the practice. So we'll talk about folks who really feel that that separated facility is important to getting more people to cycle. The whole idea of safety in numbers is very important to a lot of folks. So if you have a lot of folks cycling in a community, it's likely that drivers will recognize that and be more aware of those cyclists. Other folks feel that there is safety in being mixed with traffic. If, if the speeds are low enough. So you become more visible, uh, you act as a vehicle and demand the respect that a, a motor vehicle would as well. And it's very interesting, both sides are really passionate and there's some research that supports each of those types of, uh, of conclusions. So it's, it's a very hot topic right now. And you've also been looking at uh, uh, freeway interchanges uh, and how they interact with peds and bikes. What have you been doing there? Well, over the last, boy, I want to say five meetings of our council, we've tried to get a broad perspective from, we've gotten over 100 people involved in how best to accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists in interchanges. They're really difficult conflict points because folks are always traveling at a high rate of speed coming off of a freeway or entering onto a freeway, and mixing that with non-motorized traffic, which of course is a lot slower, presents some real safety challenges. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a difficult problem. Uh, why is it an important one? Well, oftentimes a connection across a limited access highway is the best way for folks to get from one origin to another destination. Uh, kind of by definition, if you think about it, freeways don't have a lot of bridges crossing them and oftentimes those bridges are associated with interchanges. So if people are trying to get from one side to the other, they have to brave this particular type of situation, crossing ramps. And uh, the best way we can, can accommodate it uh, provides more opportunities for people to walk and bike, especially those who don't have other options. Where are you in that process? What's gonna come out of it? Well, what we're hoping to do is, is develop a, a recommended practice of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, which is a very important document, really create, has a lot of weight within the professional community. Uh, we've conducted all of our interviews with folks uh, who are interested in the profession and have had their ideas. We've developed a, a basic synthesis report saying here are the types of practices that are currently used. And then we're going to be going through a review and balloting process to make sure that it's really the best report for practitioners. You know, people that thought transportation engineering is just, you know, moving trucks and trains and boats and planes, uh, but there's a lot going on that involves just people on two feet then. That's absolutely true, uh, especially as transportation costs increase. The typical household in America, transportation is the second highest cost that they have behind housing. Uh, in, in tough economic times, it's very difficult to maintain two cars, keep gas in them, insurance, what have you. Uh, in areas where people have options, it's best to provide facilities that they can take advantage of those options. And I was close to
close enough, you know, I always walk to school and on occasion. We're in Minneapolis, Minnesota, talking with Deb Hubsmith, who's director of the Save Us to School National Partnership. What is the partnership? The National Partnership is a coalition of more than 550 organizations, and we're looking to advance the Safe Routes to School national movement, bringing together pedestrians, health organizations, planners, smart growth, equity groups, youth, big ten to bring everybody together. What is Safe Routes to School? Safe Routes to School is making it safer and easier for kids to walk and bike to school so we can be healthier, have less pollution, and more livable communities. What's been going on here in Minneapolis this week? Well, I'll tell you, John, it's been amazing here. There's more than 600 people who are here in Minneapolis. It's been great weather. People have been attending mobile workshops, getting on the nice ride bikes that they have here in Minneapolis. They've been hearing speakers like Victor Mendez from the Federal Highway Administration, James Corliss from Transportation for America. There's been a lot of talk about public health, about reducing childhood obesity, sharing best practices. It's been really exciting. And this is the, the third Safe at School conference. Uh, how's it changed since the first one? Well, the first one we actually had in Michigan back in um, 2007, and we had about 400 people at that conference. We had the most recent one in 2009 in Portland, and we had about 530 people there. This one with more than 600 people has really grown a lot. All the conferences have had great hosts and have been in beautiful locations. And I'd say that the numbers of people and the diversity of folks from throughout the United States, we've got people from almost every state here and all kinds of communities, urban, rural, suburban, Urban, and really looking to be able to have more on this conference on youth and also engaging people from all different levels of income. So there's been a big focus on um, working to make sure that we're serving the people that need it most, the most vulnerable communities that we have here in the United States. Now what, what sort of challenges do, do people face when they, you know, they get started on a Safe Routes to School program and, you know, and then, What's, what challenges are facing them and then what resources are there out there for them? Sure, well, uh, one of the biggest challenges, which I'm sure everybody has, is money. People need money for their programs, they need money for infrastructure, they want to have connected sidewalks, bike lanes and pathways, and then you also need volunteer power. You want to have parents to be able to lead walking school buses and bike trains, and so resources that are out there, thanks to the Federal Transportation Bill and Congressman Oberstar, who is here actually yesterday on the opening day, State Departments of Transportation have money to make available to cities and schools and nonprofits to run programs and build infrastructure. So that's great. Right now, one of the things and the challenges that we're facing is that Congress is facing the money issue, the federal debt, looking to reauthorize the transportation bill, and we're fighting to keep Safe Routes to School in there. And even before you had the federal program, where you're from in California, there was a state Safe Routes to School program. Um, well, how did how did that work before the feds got involved? Yeah, before the feds got involved, we did have a program in California. We were one of the few. Uh, California is one of the places where we do things first, which is one of the reasons why I moved there about 20 years ago. And California dedicated some of their highway safety money starting in 1999 because they realized that a lot of our traffic fatalities were happening on local roads, not just on highways. And so previously, all the highway safety money was going to guardrails and barriers and things like that. Um, we worked together with James Corliss and the Surface Transportation Transportation Policy Project to make the case that we need to improve safety for our kids too. And the California legislature agreed. So that was the beginning and um, it was so popular and with the pilot programs that Mr. Oberstar funded, one of them run in Marin and one of them run in Arlington, Massachusetts, a whole national movement got built. And so instead of having a piecemeal approach with everybody doing things differently, we were all of a sudden able to have federal funding and every state still developed their program in their own way, but there were resources available for infrastructure and infrastructure and there was also a dedicated person at the state DOT level who's responsible for the program. So what what are the roles of the different levels of government? You know, the, the, the federal government, state government, you know, local government, local school districts, uh, you know, 
What are the different roles? How do they all work together to make this happen? Well, that's a big question you got there. I think I could do a workshop on that, but let me see if I can answer that really quickly. At the federal level, the feds authorize the money, and that goes to the state departments of transportation. Then we work at the state level to structure the program so that schools and cities can apply. The cities actually maintain the roads and build the infrastructure, the sidewalks, the pathways, the crosswalks. The schools have the kids come there to learn, and they set policies about where bike racks are on their school, kids being able to walk and bike to school, principals can allow for promotion in the schools, and um, having all those levels work together are important. Another level that's emerging is the regional level for the metropolitan planning organizations because that's required by the federal government and they develop long-range transportation plans and so we've been working with some regional entities in, also in order to be able to create additional resources for use at the local level. In places, uh, you know, schools where they put safe routes to school into practice, uh, more kids are walking to school. Why is that important to the, the children? What difference does it make for them? Well, it's great. I mean, we've known for a long time that when you walk and bike, you feel healthier, you feel more energetic. And what's great now is that there are research studies that are actually showing that, and they're actually showing that there's a link between physical activity and academic performance. If kids are exercising before tests, they do better on their tests than if they're just sitting there. So um, that's important for schools because schools are measured on academic achievement. So we have a direct interest now that's evidence-based that shows that. Um, there's also also evidence around childhood obesity and the fact that kids are doing better when they're more fit. We're in Edina, Minnesota, talking with Emily Betke. What's this street we're standing on? Uh, this is Cornelia Drive. And why would you walk with your family along Cornelia Drive? Um, well, there's many reasons. One, um, it would be to get to the city pool, which is at the other end of Cornelia Drive. Um, and the most important would be to get to our neighborhood school, which is across 70th Street. And then also just for fun and, you know, to be out in the neighborhood, walking, walking dogs, running, riding bikes, all sorts of things. And we're standing on the sidewalk right here. How much of Cornelia Drive has a sidewalk? Um, just this little stretch, which is probably about... You know, that's probably like 100, 125 yards, and then it ends. So um, the majority of the stretch of the street um, has no sidewalks at all. You know, what does that do for you and your family when you're trying to walk along it? Um, well, it makes it really hard because we're always having to dodge uh, traffic. Um, there's especially no place for kids to ride their bikes, scooter, um, Walking, we're always having to walk around parked cars, um, dodging traffic. Um, you know, if there's anything like snow, we're pushed further out into the street. So in the middle of winter, we always feel like we're walking kind of in the middle of the street. And here we've got a median, which I think the intention was to slow the traffic down. But um, when the sidewalk doesn't get uh, shoveled and there's a huge snow bank, we're pushed even further into the road and then um, the space here is so narrow that especially right by the school it can get really um, dangerous where walkers are just you know too close to cars. So how how long is the walk from your house to the school? Um, I would say it's about a third of a mile. I think it's a little under a half mile um, so it's not far at all. It's, it's a really nice little walk um, you know in the morning to go to school and it takes us uh, like seven to ten minutes depending on you know what the weather is like so it's it's a very short walk it's a very nice walk pleasant walk except for the lack of sidewalks <laughs> so do your neighbors uh, kids walk to school then since it's so nearby um, they a lot of them do um, especially when the weather is nice but this is Minnesota and of course um, last year we had an especially snowy year and um, our winter started in November and then um, the snow wasn't done melting until like mid to late April. So that's like a large chunk of the school year. Um, and I think uh, once the snowbank started to build up and kids started to get pushed further out into the roadway, um, parents opted to drive their kids to school or have them take the bus. Because um, it, re it really was dangerous. I think we were the only people who walked to school every day. and. Um, you know, it was definitely uh, 
not always probably the safest option. <laughs> What's the process for getting a sidewalk built uh, here in uh, Edina? Um, in Edina, what we have to do is um, have uh, the residents agree um, that, that a sidewalk is something that they want. Um, which um, isn't always that easy to get a majority of residents to agree on. And um, the city assesses the um, adjacent property owner for the cost of 50% um, of the sidewalk. The city pays 25% and the school district pays the other 25%. And then the homeowner has to pay um, the other 50%. Um, so we don't have to pay the whole cost, but it still ends up being, you know, it. The last time we were assessed, it was in the thousands of dollars, um, and that's a lot. It's it's not always something people want to pay for. Would there be other ways to do it to get sidewalks put in near schools like this? Yeah, um, if you live in uh, what's known as a walking shed zone, which is a term of art that just describes an area where the city has found uh, safe routes to get to a school or a pool or a park, you can spread the cost out throughout that entire zone and then every homeowner um, will pay a portion of the costs for um, say sidewalks on a couple of busy streets instead of um, the homeowner having to take on that entire cost. Um, which is a nice way to spread out the cost. And um, we're, we're hoping that if we can do that, we can get um, sidewalks for hundreds of dollars per homeowner instead of thousands of dollars, which would be you know, a lot easier, um, I think, to, to gather the support of the neighbors if it wasn't quite so expensive. We're in Omaha, Nebraska, talking with Bob Mancuso with Corporate Cycling Challenge. What's been going on here this morning? Hey, we're glad to have you guys here. It's uh, Well, we've got the 21st annual Corporate Cycling Challenge bicycle ride. So it's one of the largest bicycle rides in the Midwest. Um, that's going on today right here at beautiful Omaha, Nebraska. we got a sunshine day, August 21. Okay. And who's, who's riding in this today? Well, we've got over... 4,300 is our estimated numbers right now. One day bicycle ride, it's our largest to date, it's a new record. Um, we've had over 4,000 for probably the last four or five years and it's continued to grow a little bit each year. It's made up of three different groups. We have a corporate and a company division. We have club riders like a Bellevue Bicycle Club and then we have individual riders. So all three segments, and it's open to anyone, open to individuals can ride. What's it take to put on an event like this? I mean, I'm sure you've been pretty busy the recent days. Oh, absolutely. It, well, it's a lot of fun for one because a lot of the volunteers and the committee people, they all know it's for a good cause. So we help raise the funds to help go towards trail development in eastern Nebraska, greater Omaha, Iowa. And that's you know what keeps most people going. I and mean, It's in a fun event and it's good for bicyclists. It helps promote being healthy, being active, getting out and enjoying the weather and or enjoying the trails in the city, seeing a lot of different beautiful sights in Omaha. And you mentioned how you know, this benefits the Eastern Nebraska trails. Right. Uh, how does that work? What sort of trails are you all getting built? Right. Well, in Omaha, we recently, we've got a brand new pedestrian bridge, which overspans the Missouri River. And that was built about three or so years ago. One of the largest span pedestrian bridges over a river that's in the, in the world, they said and uh, we helped donate over $25,000 through Corporate Cycling Challenge to that effort. And then we've also, over the years, we've donated over $110,000 to trail development and improvements in Eastern Nebraska, Greater Omaha. So some of the things we've been doing recently have done with our downtown Omaha area with improving our, what we call the downtown loop, <clears throat> an area for bicyclists to ride, with also providing bike racks throughout that route and improving the street markings, those kind of things. So each year you have the corporation with uh, the most miles? Yes. <clears throat> who's, uh, who's been the leader in recent Some years? Companies. So what we do on our, uh, how the corporate challenge part works is there's different size companies and there's probably four different sizes. And so there's four different categories based on the total number of employees that work at that company. And of our large division, the winner for probably five or six of the last um, five of the six last years has been Union Pacific Corporation. 
They have a huge bicycle following and they really support the ride, get out all their people to be active and do the ride. Nebraska Medical Center and the University of Nebraska Medical Center, they uh, are a second place team for most of this time and have, have won it one year in the large division category. But there's three other divisions that you know a lot of different companies have won and participate in. And so you really compete against companies your own size to try to get them out and get them bike riding and get them to be healthy. And what does a winner get besides bragging rights? <laughs> Mostly they get bragging rights, but they do get a trophy each year. We have a captain celebration about a, two weeks after the event where we thank all the captains and we have pizza and we have a nice little ceremony and then they get their trophies there for their winning teams and mostly as a thank you for all those captains that have helped support the event. But uh, and they all really enjoy it and I think the benefits for the companies, not only is the companies get to participate, it's some camaraderie, they support a good cause, but it's healthy and it helps their employees be more active, which ideally they're going to live longer, live better, be a bit more productive employee and be a more happy employee that'll help that company's bottom line. So, and also going with the bottom line, it'll help improve their cost because if they're more healthy, they're not gonna go to the doctor as much, they're not gonna need as many potentially, you know, hospital type of things as they get older. So by them being active and supporting their employees and their associates and their family members, because they can also participate, that helps in the, the cycle of it that they'll be more active and be a, you know, more healthy employee. You mentioned family members, you got the different lengths. Do you see uh, a lot of families out here, kids riding? Yes, we do. We have three different routes. So the good news is there's something for everybody. You know, right here in Omaha, there's a 10 mile ride, which is a shorter distance, more for the family. Some youth ride that event. Then there's a 25 mile ride, which is the middle ride, kind of in between. You know, if you're not a consistent rider or a rider very often, you might be able to make the 25. And then the long route is the 42 mile ride. What lessons have you learned that uh, you know other cities that are thinking of doing something like this, uh, you know, might learn from your experience? Well, I mean, everything is different every year. You always kind of try to have contingencies and backup plans. You know, we try to make this a one-day, you know, event that it's a win-win for the city. We've actually had people from other cities, probably the five, seven surrounding states. We have cyclists entered in our ride that are from those states, Missouri, Iowa, Colorado, South Dakota, Nebraska for sure, come to this event now because it's starting to grow and people are really starting to plan for it or look forward to it. We're at a good time frame. Um, the community supports it. We've got, you know, definitely you need great sponsors that help put the event on and get involved. Um, and we've got a great group of sponsors that support the event. And so that all contributes and helps make it a successful event that's been going on now for our 21st annual. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.